Five bucks a pop. I'll take one. I want one, too. Eight bucks. But you just said... Demand suddenly skyrocketed. You all saw it. Hi everyone, I'm Luke Hector and you're watching The Broken Meeple. This is a YouTube channel about board games where I give reviews, top tens, and my honest opinions, regardless of the consequences. Get on with it. So even though I'm a little late to this party, though not by much, I'm taking a look at Kudna Horror, The City of Silver. Now, wow, if you asked me which game do you reckon would be the most divisive at and Luke, I can tell you now, I wouldn't have picked this. I would have thought that this would have been kind of clear cut one way or the other, but Whew. Recent reviews have come out for this game and I can tell you that if you look on the internet rubble, 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 rubble. Honestly, it's kind of insane. Some people really love this game, some people really hate this game and it's really getting people talking. The question is whether this contrasting view is warranted, you know, where do I sit? But remember, this was the game that I had high on my anticipated games list. I think I put this at number five. I was really keen on this idea of a dynamic price market and being able to kind of exert control or influence over what prices the various commodities are. I've um, got some thoughts about that as well as other bits and bobs here. So uh, here goes nothing, I guess. Well, we're boned. So Kudna Horror has you dealing with the silver boon that basically attracted loads of people from around Europe to the city when it was discovered several centuries ago. The idea is, is that you as players will be excavating mines down below as well as building buildings up above in order to score victory points and you will build buildings from various guilds which deal with a different commodity. Those commodities have prices that will fluctuate as the game goes on depending on what the players will do and you have to essentially manipulate this market while also manage to build or excavate what you need in order to score the most points at the end of the game. The turn sequence is pretty straightforward. You have six cards available to you each round. They are dual use and they have an action. They have two actions on them. And these actions are repeated a couple of times on each and there's a joker as a wild. And the idea is, is that in your first turn each round, you'll play two cards and resolve the actions. Next turn, you'll play another two. And then the last turn, you'll play only one. So one doesn't get used and you've essentially done five things in the round. This will rinse repeat for the remaining rounds of the game. But the idea is, is that once you have used a card for one set action, like say I want to use this for income, I can no longer use this card now for building. I've used it for income, that's it. I have to deal with the fact that I've lost one building action because I decided to do income. I could always do building on this card though, but now I don't have another plot action. So you have to really be careful as to which cards you use in a particular round and plan ahead for what it is you need to do. The various actions allow you to buy plots over the land so you can reserve spaces to, to build. The rights to actually get said buildings, such as this uh, horse mill, for example, which uh, got a few jokes as we played it during the game as to what exactly happens in a horse mill, but uh, I digress. And you'll also be able to build public buildings as well. And the idea with these buildings is not only do they increase your production and also change up the pricing market, but they have icons on the corners, which are colored symbols. And basically you'll score victory points at the end of the game based on your buildings coordinating with those color symbols. You also, on top of that, will be able to generate income via your production tracks, which are essentially on your player board and update as you build more buildings. You can contribute to the building of a church because let's face it, in every medieval game, of course, there's the building of a church. It just happens, the St. Barbara Cathedral in this case. And you can, can, of course, go mining down below, which involves you essentially paying the cost and flipping over little tiles, which you'll build down orthogonally, and you are attempting to get stars in each row. So if you have lots of stars in a particular row, it's a lucrative one for points, and essentially whoever has the most miners covering the most stars will get victory points for a second and third at the end of the game. That's easy! So Kudnohar actually fills the slot of being a very unique game overall. Yeah, there's a bunch of euros out there that involve building up a city or building a church somewhere. That's a dime a dozen, we know they exist, it's not a problem. But in terms of the whole pricing market thing, that is not being done in a lot of Euro games to the extent where you are having this much influence over it. The one game that came to my mind when I first heard about this was one that I played called Feudum. This is a huge, heavy Euro game, like mammoth of a game, ton of rules, very meaty, 
but very fun. And that one had guilds that you basically could take control of or do various services for. And each guild fed into another guild, which its services fed into another guild and so on in a big circular fashion. Really cool game, probably one I'll never get to play again because it's just so big, huge, and I don't own it. But this one felt to me kind of like a mini version of that, except that the guilds don't necessarily feed into each other, but they have different influences of how the game progresses. But other than that, these sort of dynamic pricing markets are not something you see every day in a Euro game. Usually the markets are very static, or it's like a flip of a card and it just happens to be a market. But this one, the idea that the players are influencing it is a whole lot different than other stuff I've seen. So you truly have quite a unique title here. Not to say that there are none in existence, that have a dynamic pricing market. I just personally don't know of many myself, so by all means, get it in the comments if you do. Components and aesthetics wise, generally good, but still a bit of a mixed bag. I get why they did this cover. I know the historical reason why it's got the silver coin with the silhouetted city in the background. Not exactly a looker on the shelf though, it has to be said. That being said, there are some components here that even though some of these are fairly generic, you know, fairly basic looking tiles and guards and coinage and that, there are some components here I really do like. Firstly, from a rules perspective, these reference aids, really good. They explain a lot of the iconography, a lot of the important rules. This reference guide will see you go far. The player trays that you have, sorry, the player boards, they are those ones where you put the little stickers on and then fold them down and it creates a dual layer board. You know what? I'm cool with these. Yes, it makes unboxing take a while, but if this enables you to do dual layer boards on the cheap, they still work, not gonna come apart. And if it means that the price cost of the game doesn't skyrocket, I mean, it's not the most expensive game in the world, then you know what? I'm down for it. But the bits I kind of really like are these cards and tiles, which look, seem like they've got this silver foil kind of lining on them that really glistens in the light. I'm not sure how well it will do on camera, but when you see them up close, you can just see them shine. And when you've got these all over the board, you know, in gold and silver, and then you've got your cards out, it does bring on a nice little kind of contrast to these like gray and black that you see everywhere. It's got that look for a reason. I know that it's not trying to stand out as some big Vince Drake color extravaganza, but it is kind of hit and miss, you know, I like it sort of, and there are bits that I do really like, but it's not necessarily one that's gonna turn heads all the time. The thing I really do like though is this rewood stuff, rewood, it's effectively recycled wood, and they make a big deal about this in the rule book, but these wooden pieces that you have for your houses and that, they're really good sculpts, and if this is the idea that you can basically like reuse wood to create stuff like this, then I'm all down for it. Question is, is it quite as um, sustainable as it's cracked up to be? But you know what? <laughs> I'd have to find out more details on that. But suppose to say, if this is like what you can do with wooden components now, then I think we're on the threshold of trying something really cool without needing expensive miniatures, which are unnecessary. We have found the witch, may we burn out? The main highlight for this game is the pricing market itself. Essentially, you've got this deck of cards in both dividers and it sits behind here and it shows the prices essentially through the slits there. And as you pull these strips along, which is usually when you build buildings, then the prices can manipulate, but also sometimes you'll have to take a card, put it behind, and it changes the prices even more so. This one based on population, and this one based on mining silver out of the mines. Now, this is definitely the focus point of the game. The idea being that players' actions will manipulate the pricing market. I wanted this to be something that I could have direct control over, know exactly what I'm gonna do to mess it up or make it go the way I want or make it go the way someone else wants and vice versa. And I was really hoping it was gonna nail that aspect. It sort of does. It does for the most part, but maybe not quite as much control as I wanted. The, the idea that this pricing market does change as you flip the cards and that is really cool. So if somebody comes along, builds a sawmill, then suddenly the price of wood just went from three down to one. And I can't build any more wooden buildings anymore until we get more population in. So, okay, let's increase the population. Oh, the price of wood just went up to two. Let's increase it one more time. Now, it's still two, but I can now build another wooden building. Okay, let's do that. And now the price goes back down to one. So you do have some influence over these prices, but you don't know what's gonna come up on the next card. And not all of the cards will shift the price. So it's all well good saying, right, I'm going to build this building. Okay, I built this building. I expect the price to come down. Oh, it didn't. 
Oh, I was kind of hoping it would make uh, you know, wood a little bit cheaper in that respect, but okay, fine. And then you might turn over a mining tile, and the mining tile lets you add another card, you know, flip a card from this deck. Okay, so let's put the silver deck back in here. So at the moment, silver is worth three. Okay, let's uh, turn the next card, and it's still worth three. Ah, I was kind of hoping it would go up. And because you can't see ahead of time what those numbers are going to be, you don't have as much control as I kind of hoped you would. But that being said, this isn't the good section for a reason. I do like that you at least are sort of controlling the market. And, you know, if I want wood to stay expensive, I can deliberately hold on to a sawmill and say, you know what, I don't feel like building this yet. Because I would like, you, I know you lot are about to build. You've got plots reserved, you've got all the money to build. You're waiting for wood to get cheaper. Well, you know what? I don't want wood to become cheaper right now. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go mine or I'm going to get some other buildings to deal with. In bird culture, this is considered a dick move. But you've also got to be concerned with production and everybody has access to a guild that's quite high income generating, like say food, beer, or, or production and permits. And of course, yes, it's all right to say, well, I want to make permits cheaper at some point. Well, if you can get by the fact that you don't care about the price of permits, if you can make them really expensive, then great, you've just got a nice money earner. With beer, I mean, at the moment here, beer is worth six a pop. If I've got five production in beer, I'm making 30 bucks off that. That's pretty solid. You know, maybe I'll just build one more beer pantry. Okay, that would be good. What's the worst that can happen? Ah, it's worth five now. Ugh. Uh, maybe I should have done the income before I did that. You know, there's these little decisions that you do have to make. And I like that the pricing market does change throughout the game. There's plenty of cards in the deck. There's plenty of room for manipulation of these. And in a four player game, especially, it really does turn this game into a much more tactical affair. You're not trying to play strategically. If you go into this game thinking, right, you know what? I'll probably build all four of these middle buildings and I'll get the eight points there. I'm gonna focus entirely on beer. You're probably gonna lose this game. And a lot of people, reviewers included, are getting trapped by this. You need to understand that you are supposed to react to how these price markets are developing. You need to react to how the board is developing. You need to think, well, hang on, if this happens, it could affect the price up or down. Therefore, do I wanna do something else first or do I wanna do this now? Shall I wait? Uh, you know, what's my other players doing? Well. Hang on, I know he's going to start building another one of those civic buildings soon, which means the permit price could go down. Maybe I should wait and get some miners and rights to buildings later and do something else first. Come on, build that building, build that building. Why aren't you building it now? You know, there's stuff like that that you have to be aware of. And that's what kind of makes this game really fun. It's just a solid system, but still not fun. Flawless. I would still like to have had a bit more control over knowing what numbers were going to turn up. As such, sometimes you change it, you, you do something and then you flip a card or pull a banner and nothing changes and that can be a little bit annoying when that does occur. So you get nothing! Even though you've only got six cards and they're only dual use, man does the turn angst come through with this game. I mean, I am constantly having to think at the start of the round, right, Let's see, I need to do at least one income because I'm a bit short on money. I would certainly, I don't think I need the rights action. Okay, so let's flip that one over. I could use that for St. Barbara. Okay, fine. Uh, but I'm going to need a couple of spaces on the board. Well, I need two plots then. But then if I use two plots, I can't do one of my mines and I can't even build one of my things. Well, I could use the Joker, but then I lose a reputation. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And the, you will constantly be thinking, right, how am I going to utilize these cards? You'll play two in the first turn, and then as you come to your second and third turn, you'll then have regrets, because you'll think, oh, I know I should have done those two, but maybe I should have done the cards in a different way. Maybe I should have juggled this a little bit better. And it's just a simple system that isn't quite to the level of a true multi-use card, but I do love the fact that you've got to make that decision with your actions, and that every time you do one action, you're essentially cutting one potential action out of the round, and it's just a neat, clever little system. The rules to this game are also very straightforward. The rule book is bigger than it needs to be, partially because there's a lot of decent historical information here about the city itself with actual photographs. The designers have made this a passion project for themselves. They really care about this setting. They care about the history of this city, and you can tell that throughout how they've written this rule book. 
but the rules themselves are not difficult. This is well laid out, it's easily explained. You know, it shows exactly how the price market will work. The player set up, the board set up, a picture of a fully set up board, a reference aid on the back. And did I also mention before that these reference aids you get for the players are really good. They don't take up much space, but they tell you all the different iconography on the various buildings. They tell you all the church effects, the mine effects, all your actions, the patrician scoring, the final scoring, all condensed down on a sheet. Publishers, would you take note that this is the kind of thing I want? Everybody got that? And with all that being said, it's not a long game either. With three or four players, this game takes about the same amount of time because with three players, you have six rounds, five actions, 30 actions effectively. When you have four players, you only do five rounds. So you have 25 actions, which is not that much noticeable from 30, but it balances out the fact that you have the fourth player. So the three and four player takes about the same amount of time. And honestly, you should be done with this game in less than two hours. It's mid-weight level. It's not a heavy game. You certainly need to think in it, but it's not going to burn your brain cells and the teaching won't take too long and the game doesn't take too long. It doesn't get to a point where it outstays its welcome and finally about time when a game does that. Now, I know some of you lovers of this game are going to hate me for this next section, but there are still a few flaws, despite the good things I've mentioned, that I do need to cover here. Firstly, the weak link of this game in general is one aspect that I think could have been cut out of the whole game. It didn't need to be included, and we could have done some more with these prices that maybe added two more commodities or something. But this whole St. Barbara Church thing, yes, I get that it was there, and it's a big monument and needed to be built, but... The fact that you've got this action that effectively allows you to build the different segments of this church as the game goes on. They have different effects for reputation, but they mainly give you some special bonus when you build the respective tile, but they can influence a tax marker which basically just increases how much money you need to pay at the end of the round. The effects that you get off the St. Barbara's tile are not balanced in any way, shape or form. This is like Stonemire levels of crazy balance craziness here. I couldn't even think of how to phrase that sentence, but you've got ones here that, for example, give you a free rights action. Great. How much does a rights action normally cost you? A lot of the times only one coin, sometimes maybe four coins, maybe eight if you're desperate, but most of the time you're spending mostly four coins or sometimes even one. And there are ways you can even get a rights action for free. So okay, it's an okay action to, you know, to unlock on your St. Barbara thing. You can also build an entire building for free. Um, buildings can range up to something like, you know, 10 to 12 wood and wood unless it's the cheapest rate, could be something like 24, 36, 40 plus. It could be a ton of money. Notice where I'm getting at here. You've also got another tile here that scores you a point for every public building surrounding one of your other buildings. Okay, I might get four or five points. That's pretty cool. There's a tile here that for the low cost of a little bit of reputation, it lets you do your income action twice. That is bonkers. That's putting it mildly 007. You can basically, by the time you trigger this, potentially earn up to a hundred bucks or more. You know, I've, see, I've done it once for 96 bucks. I think that's the highest I've done. I'm pretty certain I could go higher if I tried. And that much money in your pocket basically means the income action isn't necessary for you anymore. You know, occasionally you might do it just so that you can get one of those patricians out for end game scoring because you have to do it as part of the action. But, um... Yeah, a, a rights action for four money saving or 96 money in your pocket or a 40 cost building placed out in front of you. The balance of this church is just all over the shop and I wish it wasn't in the game. I don't need it. I don't care if some church got built or whatever. It's like, it just, this feels, yes, it fits the setting, but it just feels tacked on mechanically tacked on, not thematically, tack, uh, mechanically tacked on. And because these effects are so powerful in places and not so much in others, you constantly end up in this situation where people are kind of saving up the tokens so that they can activate these things in order to kind of buzz through it in one turn or they're just waiting for somebody to do the rubbish action so they can do the one after. And that's not the way I wanted this mechanic to work. It's, it's commented a lot by other people and I agree. I think this Barber Church needed some reworking. I think it needs some paste ups, you know, to balance out some of these abilities, a few house rules here and there, but it just seems like such an unnecessary part. The scoring though for the mining feels very 
inconsequential. You know, you have to basically look at how many stars are in a row and then you get first, second and third based on your minors controlling the stars, right? So most of the time, your stars in a row will be somewhere between zero to five and six to nine. I've yet to actually have a row that's had 10 or more stars in it. It just hasn't happened yet. So zero to five and 69. How many points do you get at the end of the game? But if you have first, second and third, two, one, zero and three, two, one. That's it. Yeah, that is it. The differential in points for these is so minute. Who cares? I mean, if you completely ignore it and somebody else goes mad on it, maybe there's a small differential there, but you can make up that difference in so many ways. I mean, your reputation track can earn you 13 points if you max it out. You can get four to five points from a well-placed building here. What do I care about the odd two or one here, especially when you compare to all the other players? If everybody's done a bit of mining, I might get two here, you get one. You get two there, I get zero. I get three here, you get one. The differential is just so tiny. Never has a game been decided by who did well in the mining phase. So what the hell is the point in mining? Well, it's to get the tiles out so that you can influence this marketplace and get silver production. If that wasn't a factor, I wouldn't even care about mining. I'm mainly doing it for this. I don't care how many points I get at the end. I mean, if you're faffing around at the end in your last round just to get maybe a point here or there for a star in the mining tile, then you're not playing this game too well. You really do need to focus on this and maybe your reputation and a couple of other aspects. But yeah, I wanted the mining thing just to be a little bit more, not, not necessarily interesting, but just a bit more meaningful by the time you got to the end. Well, that was pointless. Now, this next bad point is going to probably, you know, tick off a few of you, but uh, needs to be said. This is a two to four player game. I like playing this with four. Four is a good number for this game. You get a decent amount of interaction with here, three players to think about. It's not too chaotic, but there's a bit of that now and again. And free player works really well as well. I mean, you typically in free players have control of at least one of the major things you use to make stuff or get stuff, as well as at least one of the big production uh, tiles in here. And in four players, you'll get a little bit of overlap with other players. So yes, I can do beer buildings, but so can you. Are we both gonna work together on this or am I just gonna make all the beer? You know, that remains to be seen. I don't think this game works very well at two though. It's just not as interesting. You know, you you, Get, you've got a smaller board, fine, but you don't have as much influence over here, over these uh, pricing markets, because there's only two of you building stuff. You essentially have this little event deck with really minuscule, like, rubbish little effects, like, you know, at the end of the round, you get your minor pools refilled for free. Um, you know, for this round, taxes are twice the amount. Uh, at the end of the round, discard the top building tile of each stack in the leftmost column. At the end of the round, everybody gets a pelican token. At the end of the round, lose a reputation for each plot marker you have. You know, these, these aren't exactly the most interesting of effects, and they, but they do increase the tax marker. And they will also make you move the cards in these pricing markets. So they will, you know, mess around with the market at times. But it kind of then remains fairly stagnant unless the two of you do stuff. It's not that the game fundamentally fails at two, but it's very lackluster, I feel. You know, I, I, I feel that this is a game I wanna play with four as often as possible, three if we don't happen to have a fourth, but if people say, oh yeah, do you wanna play this at two? I'd rather pull out something else because I can think of a lot of Euro games that I would rather play with two. This one, the fact that you have to have this event deck just makes me feel like it was an afterthought. So Good and Horror is a little bit of a mixed bag. There's more good than bad, but there's still some issues that this game has that I wish it didn't, and it does affect my enjoyment. The St. Barbara is probably the biggest problem I have. I do not think this is balanced. I do not think this was necessary, and I think it could have been handled better. If players are aware of the power level of this church, it's mitigated to an extent, but when you've got new players in the game who don't quite realize just how insane these effects are, it can be a little bit problematic for them, and you have to spend time explaining how these effects are more powerful than others. I would have also liked the mining to be a bit more meaningful at the end of the game. It's it's worth doing at some point during the game, but the point differential was so small, it just seems like another fiddly aspect of scoring I don't need. So, and I would have liked maybe had just a bit more impact on the pricing markets. You have some, but maybe I would have just liked that little bit of extra predictability with the numbers. 
That being said, that's essentially the bad point. I don't overly care if I can't play this at 2, because I never thought this would be a game I would play at 2, but it's going to annoy some of you. This is a good game to play at 3 or 4. I do like this pricing market overall. It's not perfect, it's not exactly what I wanted, but it still gives me a solid time. I do like the fact that I can hold back on buildings now and again, or I can look at the other players. I mean, this is a, a more interactive game than most. You're not necessarily just outright dicking over one player at a time, you're, but you're interested in what they're doing, thinking, well, if they're gonna build, maybe I don't wanna make wood cheaper. If he's gonna make permits more expensive, then maybe I might wanna go do this first. And so you're not necessarily doing full player interaction, but you're interested in what they're doing. This is not a solitaire game, and it's a very tactical style game, not a strategic game, which tend to be the games I enjoy more. I like the fact you've got a choice of the different buildings, and these card setups will give you a different combination of guilds, which could affect how you play. You know, whether you go high or low reputation is entirely up to you. And I particularly like this card system, which is literally just six cards that give you for for the, for the money and sort of components you have, a solid amount of turn angst for your buck, basically. It's, you know, it's got a lot going for this game. But those problems are still problems. And it it's like this game needs a 2.0, I think, to be amazing, like fantastic. But that being said, I'm still happy with 1.0 but only to the extent that I can give this one a 7 out of 10. It's good, and I do recommend it. I, I can see why people really love the game, because at first, I was up there with like 9 out of 10. I was thinking, oh yeah, this is amazing, I love this. I'm going to play this more and we'll see how things go. And then I played it more. And then some of those kinks in the armor started showing, and I started realizing, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, there are some issues here. And so, now that I've had a chance to sort of collate those thoughts, I center on a seven. I still think this is a good economic, tactical, you know, you know, interactive Euro game with a cool pricing market system. It's not a flawless pricing market system. It does have one or two unbalanced elements in the game. And certainly I don't recommend this for two players. But me, I'm probably gonna hang on to this game. I'm kind of umming and ahhing about it. But it's not often that there's a Euro game that I want to bring out with the maximum number of players and know that it won't take a huge amount of time. This is it. So, could have been better, you know, I would maybe like to see a revised version of this in the future, or maybe an expansion to change up a few things and maybe make this a bit more impactful, or maybe improve the mining system, or completely scrap this church and replace it with a new module, that'd be really cool. But you'd have to then give us a new card, I don't know. Who knows what they could do down the line. But, uh, so far, decent. Just not great. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you've seen, then please thumb it up on YouTube and please go follow the link to Board Game Geek and thumb up that video as well. Let's get it in the hot review section. That would make my day. Just click on the link, the review's there, click on the thumb, that's it. No other obligation, but that would be so fantastic if we could get a lot of those there. Also, don't forget to check out the other reviews I've done, including the recent Nucleum, you know, big hotness of, your, of, of Essen. You know, given that I don't like the two predecessors it's based on, one of my thoughts on the actual game, by all means, check it out. So take care, and remember, regardless of how much you want to price your beer today, preferably cheap, please, I'm getting rather thirsty, it's still only a game. Bye for now, everyone.